Okay, well, welcome to the Universal Audio booth. Um, I have the great pleasure here to have Daryl Thorpe with us, and we are going to talk about how to make a good sounding record. Sure. How's that a concept? Uh, good, concept. good concept. Yes, All right. Good concept. So, uh, Daryl had the great uh, kindness to bring his Foo Fighter mix. So you just mix the Foo Fighter record. Yes. And uh, you heard of the Foo Fighters? Good little band. I see a future for them. I think they're they're they're, they're on the up and it. up. They're gonna do okay. Yeah, they're gonna do fine. Yeah. I think there's talent there. Yeah. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna open the session that actually is the session from the record that they were brought. Fair? Well, it better be fair because that's what's gonna happen no matter what. <laughs> All right, here we go. And now here's the session that Pro this. Tools. Amazing song came through. That is a pretty big session there, Daryl. <laughs> I got it. And it's yes. like, Daryl sent me a session. Hey, here's the session. And I'm like, so I click on the download thing, and I'm like, oh. Oh, that's going to take a second. It's but at least it's only 44.1. Right. I was in Peru when you sent it. I couldn't download it from there. It just didn't work. <laughs> so I had to wait to come back to the US to download it. It was way, way too huge. Uh, this is a 44.1 session? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So how did, how did this come to be? Song? Yeah. Oh, uh, this was a really interesting song. So we, uh, we started the record in 20, December of 2016 at Studio One at United, uh, sorry, East, Studio One at East West, which is the famed Bill Putnam rooms. Yep. Uh, then we took a little bit of a Christmas break. Then we hit it back hard in January, February. Then there was a short break because of uh, uh, spring breaks with children and bands, so family vacations happened for like two weeks. And then we, uh, so that Dave was like, well, should we move over to Studio Two just for something different? And I was like, sure, Studio Two is great. And then, um, uh, so he went on vacation and, uh, and then he came back and he called me the morning of the session and was like, Daryl, are you ready to record? I'm like, yeah, I'm ready to record. I wrote another song on vacation. I was like, I thought you were on vacation. <laughs> no, I wrote a song. And was, so we started cutting this. This is the, the last song the, that we cut on the record. And it was kind of fun because we just did it in a different room entirety. So that was great. So you were tracking this record? Yes, yes. So you record and you mix. I recorded, I mixed, and... That's a very interesting perspective to have, to be able to track records and mix them. Most people who mix records don't track them anymore. No, no. So when people are telling me, like, oh, uh, I mean, quite honestly, I didn't find out until end of February that I was going to mix it. I just assumed that it was going to go... You know, elsewhere. Elsewhere. Yeah. Totally assumed that. So, And then when I was told, oh, no, you're mixing it, I was like, oh, sweet. <laughs> Good. Good. I don't have to justify anything that no, went wrong. <laughs> no. And uh, I, I will say, honestly, uh, my mixes are kind of my rough mixes. Right. I, uh, the, the, an interesting thing happened with the band where we would do an overdub, and they would, somebody would leave the room, and I would spend about five or ten minutes taking the new part, whatever it be, a guitar or whatever, and I'd uh, do a little EQ on it and rebalance it, blend it in, do a little automation on it, and the next part would come in. So I kind of just spent the course of... Mix as you go. I, I mixed as I went. So, and, and I tried to like mix, mix, it failed miserably. So yeah. Dave was like, dude, your roughs sound great. So I, I like this. This, so. this does sound very lush and beautiful. Thank you, thank you. And I looked at the session because I'm supposed to. Yeah. So I analyzed the session and I thought it was exquisitely recorded. Thank you. Um, so why don't we listen at, well, first, um, the number one question I get for my mixes is, oh, hey, dude, what do you do on your two bus? So why don't we look at what, hey, dude, Okay. what do you do on your two bus? Well, why don't I play like the chorus and I'll... Uh, yes. So I can open up with handy dandy And this is... Shift. A, this was all mixed in the box? This was all mixed in the box, yeah. I tried to do an actual mix on a console and once again it failed miserably. So uh, Dave was just super happy with the way my roughs were sounding as in is in the box and nobody has seemed to have a problem the fact that it was mixed in the box so uh, Dave was like I don't want it to change I want it to sound just like this when it goes out in the real world and I'm like well we just keep it in the box sweet makes it easier for me can you pr can you bring your mic closer I know excuse me yeah is that better 
Yeah, it's more Britney Spears like this. Mm. Yeah, it's got Lovely. more of a Britney vibe. Britney vibe, here we yes, go. Okay. Nice. All right, now we are talking. Um, so, okay, so we are talking about the Foo, the Foo Fighters here, who are like, you know, the, the big priests, the last few big priests of rock and roll, who, um, who, who are in love with something, the way something sounds in the box, in the computer, and using, there's a great deal of UAD plugins going on, obviously. Yes. So what's, how many, what's your rig? Do you have an Apollo, a Twin, a, a Satellite? How, how did you function? Uh, no, I function on a, I'm an Avid user, so I function on a Pro Tools rig, an HDX yeah. rig okay. with uh, two Octo cards. Two Octo cards. And my, my uh, arsenal yeah. at all times. So um, um, I, I usually need the DSP. Yeah. For an HDX, especially like a session like this because it's 108 tracks. Yes. You can't then, open it otherwise. No. Well, you can, but then you run into some crazy latency yeah. issues. Issues. So. Yeah. Blah, so blah, what's blah. going on on YouTube, us? Oh well, first, but first things first. I usually like to compress my two mix, but I like to do it very gently, very leisurely. So it's a like if you. How much do you want to turn down, Fab? <laughs> So first and foremost, I'm compressing, and I'm doing like, I, man, I'm kind of crazy. I do a slightly medium fast attack and a slightly medium fast release, mm -hmm. and I'm only usually doing a couple of, barely a dB of compression. It's just like a gentle squeeze. Squeeze. That thing does that very well. Yes, just a little containment because yeah, because there is the Shadow Hills. The 33609 works really well. So yep. does the API 2500 works really yep. well on the mix bus. And that's the genius part about having the UAD Arsenal plugins is like, well, I can try the Shadow Hills. That doesn't work. Oh, I can try the new SSL. That sounds amazing. A uh, little too mushy for this project. Need something a little cleaner. Oh, the Shadow Hills works perfect. OK. So yes. that's why I picked the Shadow Hills in this situation. Very nice. Um, this Shadow Hills is actually the UAD rendition of a gigantically heavy <laughs> seven, six, seven U uh, mastering compressor that is in a lot of mastering houses, but the, the plugin sounds bananas. Snagger sounds bananas. And I do, I, I'm, I'm a, uh, a firm believer of, not always, but a firm believer, I run my compressor in dual mono. Yep. Well, uh, you... It helps with your imaging. Yeah. Uh, there's times when you can put a, a compressor on a mix bus and you run it in uh, uh, link yeah. mode with stereo link mode, so it's just one threshold controlling both channels. But the, in the case of like where uh, crazy guitars are poking in and out, which there are on this song, I was like, well, I wanted to run it in dual mode, and sometimes it works for your advantage, where you get a little wider imaging going on with the dual mode. Yep. Dual mono mode compression. The the kicker is, is you just have to really make sure that your settings are exactly the same. And I have noticed that I've adjusted one thing and not the other side. I'm like, why does my mix sound slightly askew? All the man. Oh, I gotta. Yeah. Check. Yeah. It's, so, it's, I'm, do you get do you guys get the difference between like a stereo? And a dual linked. So on a stereo, in a stereo environment, if something happens on the right, say a tom is hard pan right, it hits really hard. In a stereo environment, the whole track goes down, right? But in a dual mono, just the right track is going to go down more, which is going to widen the stereo image. And if you do micro things like that, then you get a, a better stereo image, and you get. But if you screw up, <laughs> then you know you're in this position for the rest of the mix. It's good to do, but you got to know what you're doing. And then what else? Uh, and then next, uh, I wanted a little bit of EQ on the, max to the, the master bus. Mm -hmm. I just felt like overall the track was missing a little bit of clarity. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really good about in my individual tracks about EQing to get a finalized product or a finalized timbre overall on my mix. But then sometimes I just go, eh, it's just sounding a little dark to me. It needs a little bit of breath to liven it up so there's clarity and you can hear detail of the instruments that are going on in there. And it makes the guitars feel a little more exciting as well because it's a rock band after all. So in this case, I go really, I learned from a mastering engineer that, that uh, used to live at Ocean Way. And he told me like when he, he does uh, adjust high frequency on a two mix or for a master, he does 
24K or 28K. And so I've always like, oh, that's such a great trick of getting <sighs> instead of which is where like a 10K, 12K works. Yep. So that's why in this case, I always grab the millennia because there was a 21K shelf and I'm grabbing what, that's probably 3DB, which that seems like a lot, but at 12K, it's kind of not a lot. No, way up high because the bell is very slow. Slow. So it's going to just kiss the top that you hear, but it's going to do it in a gentle way. If you did have these DBs at 10K, it would be harsh. So this is a very good technique. And then also, I like to add a little bit more low end just to get the track a little bigger. And so I'm adding a couple dB at 100 hertz, it looks like, which is a good realm to get the bass and the kick drum to feel a little bigger in the mix. Post, especially because sometimes in compression, you lose a little bit of low end. It's just the nature of the beast. So if you can just add it back post, it it makes things a little bit tighter. It usually makes things really tight, actually. So yep. that's the trick. And then what else? Uh, and then I, I do usually cut a little bit of 250 hertz. I think I'm doing a half dB here off my two mix just to get rid of that low mid rumble, make yeah. the track feel a little tighter. You know, and if I can't, you want to, is it loud volume right now? It's good volume. OK, so why don't I just do a needle drop. I'll bypass the EQ. Right, and I'll do the same place with the EQ in. Did you guys hear that? I know. Right, who would like to be pointed to what to listen to? Um, you're all professionals. Amazing. That's gorgeous. And I do, you know, there, there is a like, thing of like, well, can't the mastering engineer do that? And I'm like, well, yeah, but Why? I try to get it as done as I can with the tools that I have going to mastering. Because if he plays this track out of his amazing playback chain, it's just going to sound that much better than him having to yep. try and crank out what I've given him. So. Also, it's a great suggestion to send to your mastering engineer something that you actually like. Yes. You know, it's like you send this stuff to the mastering engineer and say, you know, did the best I could. Merry Christmas. You know, but I mean, you know, there's one. times when I'm like, hey, dude, I got, a, I got an issue and I couldn't fix. Can you please hook me up? Yes. Please. please. Yes. Uh, I do that all the time, I'll admit. <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> what uh, else you got on there? OK, uh, so I usually go in the traditional sense of like if I'm mixing on a console, uh, which Pro Tools is a uh, ginormous digital console. And I go compression first, then I EQ, and then uh, the last part of my chain is I use the UAD ATR 102 plugin on. I use it on a lot, a lot of my mixes. There are certain times, I would say, dancey kind of electronic music where it doesn't quite work. It's a little too slow. It's a little too slow because you want that digital snap punch that they're looking for. So that's usually the case where I'm like, eh, I always try it. But then again, so I can, if you guys want, I can do a little playback. So here's my mix, no ATR. OK, same thing. So here's my mix with the ATR 102. Pay attention to the shape of the bass drum and the relationship between the bass drum and the bass. All right. So you want me to do it again? Yes. And also pay attention to the attack of the snare. How does the snare feel with and how does the snare feel without? The difference between a very good documentary and a Hollywood movie. You know what I mean? Listen to the attack of the snare and listen to the relationship between the bass drum and the bass. So First here's no ATR. <laughs> OK, and then here's the ATR. So long story short, guys, a long time, a couple, a couple years ago, I had a client who uh, he, uh, I cut his record in Alabama where he lives. And he, I mixed it in Alabama where he lives. But he said he wanted to come to LA for a couple days and finish mixing. And, and run it through uh, the old uh, an 8068, which exists at Studio A at United, which was Ocean Way, which was United again, which Bill Putnam built. 
the same man who invented this company. So uh, he said he wanted to print to an ACR 102. He wanted his, his masters to go to half inch. And then I'm like, okay, sure, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's a couple hundred dollars a reel. Great. Sure, if you want to do it, okay. And then while we were doing it, uh, I was like, holy crap, I can do a shootout. I can do a shootout because I was printing to a half inch machine, real half inch machine, and I had the plug in. I duplicated the mix track, put it on another external, external on the console and sat there and AB'd. Then my friend who has a studio right across the street who's a really good engineer, I called him over. I said, dude, come listen to this. And he sat there and he goes, what do you think? And he's like, why are you spending the money on the tape machine? Yep. Yeah, it sounds honest, 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 honest truth. Honest. It sounds, it sounds bananas. It sounds bananas. Big it bananas, does. like this big. Um, and it, and it is genius because you do get the option of EMT 250, which is a great sounding tape. Awesome. Uh, 456, which is a rock sounding tape. All your favorite ACDC records were made on 456. Yep. Just a good sounding rock tape. And the then GP you have 9. the 900 and the GP9. You use the GP9 on this. Yeah, I'm using the GP9. I really like the G The GP9 usually kind of just, it's a good yeah, it's all fat. around blanket. Yeah, yeah it's, it's nice and fat. And I, and I go between 30 ips and 15 ips between the project. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the speed of the tape sorry, at yes. which the tape goes through the capstan actually changes the reaction, mostly the low end. Yes. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan of uh, Scotch 250. Hell uh, yeah. Because it just makes everything gooey and slow. Mm -hmm. And I tend to mix everything very precise and clean. So this helps me be a little cooler, you know. 250 is great for jazz. Yes. Well, yeah. That's where, yeah. 15 amps, 250. Ching, mm. ching, getting, ching, getting, getting, getting. And Wait. the cool thing too is you can do you can open up the uh, um, the slider which I do all the time and then the noise calibration where you get the up to is you can turn that on or off which funny enough I'll put an ATR plug in and I'll leave it on and I'll forget about it and then my clients is like uh, there's a little bit of hiss at the end of this song and I'm like, oh crap <laughs> and I turn it off and I reprint it and they're like oh, great what did you do oh I had a a funky plug-in thing thing so. yeah yeah. It broke. It broke. One of the plugins the broke. The plugin broke. We fixed it, though. We I fixed, fixed it. it. Yeah. yeah whatever. That's great. What else can we show the good people, these good people before we have to stop? Because Well, last but not least, just for our listening pleasure, uh -huh. I have a limiter on the mix bus just for the loudness war of NAM. But at the same token, I do, put, I do print a mix for my clients at the end of the night for them to give a CD or a USB thumbstick or just a Dropbox link, whatever, just so they can get an idea of like what it's going to sound like mastered and limited. I want them to feel like it, it's, it's a final product, even though there's probably there's still the mastering change in the, in the record process. So I do have the limiter on. How loud do you deliver these days? Uh, it always, it's always case by case. I try not to go too crazy, but there's times where I feel like it's got to be on stun. Uh -huh. And there's times where I feel like it just needs a, a little bit of a uh, little love. A little, yeah, a little excitement. Okay. Should we, should we give them a... Yeah, let's do that. Okay, so here's no limiting. And then here's limiting. I'm not going too crazy. Like though. two DBs? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, and my mix bus is out of whack. It's always out of whack. What do you mean? You, oh, you have a trim. <laughs> I have to turn down my mix well, bus. Well, you know, loud. gain management is the hardest thing in mixing. Oh, Actually, mixing is the art of. Uh, who you know Chris Muth, the guy who yes, yes. Chris Muth, who is a, a, a friend of mine, friend of ours. Yeah. Uh, he said, you know, mixing, is the art of losing gain with style. <laughs> True. I'm like, true. It's also the same guy who says, you know, you really get into mixing, and then you look at all the toys, and then you learn everything, and then you realize after a while that you use compressors as EQs and EQs as compressors. And you look and over, like, and you're like, oh, my mix sounds amazing, and your mix bus is... Yeah, it's like a, a sandbar. With no uh, limiter on it, yeah. Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, what else can we show these good people? Hey, do you have the, um, the vocal effects? Yes. Can we look at that? Okay, because that sounds really good. Yeah. Uh, so Dave, when we were uh, we he the the Foos were very much a, like a band that uh, we never cut anything live as a band. It was all drums and guy guitar first, then Dave guitar, then Pat guitar, then Shifty guitar, then bass or vice versa in that order, then keyboards, 
then and this song there's strings and then finally Dave would go in a, a dark corner and he would just bang out lyrics in like a half hour. It was crazy to watch him do that, but that's how he liked to work. So it was actually his idea that he he came in and he was like, hey Dave, hey Daryl, you know that? Uh, oh, he called me Dump Truck. Hey Dump Truck, you know that song We Can Be Heroes by David Bowie? I was like, yeah, I know. He's like, you know that room effect that happens? I was like, yeah. So I I went and I I, I Google it real quick and. Uh, uh, there was a little brief description of what they were doing, and I was like, oh, okay. So basically, the, there was a, the, it's, it's the, in the verse of the David Bowie song, it's really close and dry, and then the chorus, it, room mics open up. But they actually did it with gates, because in the verses, David would be singing really quiet, blah, 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 and then the chorus, he hits it really hard, and the gates open up to turn on the room mics and the track. That's how they actually recorded it. Because at the time, you couldn't do that stuff with digital very easily, since there was no digital. So uh, Dave had the same idea, and I was like, okay, cool. So what I did was I took a 47.2, which was his, his vocal mic for lead vocals. And uh, the great thing about you being at U either United or East West is they have a couple pairs of M50s, which if anybody knows anything about the M50, the Neumann M50 is a uh, fixed Omni room microphone. It's the microphone of choice for like drum rooms, string rooms. Uh, and normally when I do strings and such, I usually just put the rooms up and I don't turn anything else on. It's that the mics just sound that amazing. So I took uh, an M50 that was about 10 feet away from him and left it head height and another M50 10 feet away from him and left it head height. And then he got the, and then I put a, a gate, I made a three, like an LCR track so I have the lead vocal, the first room mic, and the second room mic. And then e every time I could go through and adjust the gate to open at different points. And he had that signal in his headphones, so he was playing with it when he was singing, which is why, let me just turn my groups off, guys. Sorry. So here's his, oh, where am I? Where am I? Here we go. The sky is a neighborhood. So like right here, he sings quieter on purpose. So keep it down. So the gate doesn't, the last, the Art third mic doesn't open up. Book. There it opens the up all. Sky is a so there he sings really hard. Don't make a sound. So in the track, that's why you're hearing that. The sky is a And there it doesn't sound as roomy. Is a story book. And then here the it gets a little, little more intimate. Sky is a so it was really fun. It was his idea, and he was really milking it when he performed it. So That's pretty cool. And that's basically just him in the room and three mics. Him in the room and three mics and a gate. And then post the gate, I did a little bit of... Uh, uh, I had... Uh, it was a... Uh, 47.2 with a, a Blackface 1176, or excuse me, an Aneve 1073 mic pre with a Blackface Universal Audio 1176 and then going into Pro Tools. And then I, need a, I needed a little bit of control when I started mixing it, so I did add Sky is a, a ton of compression. <laughs> and then, oh, yeah. So, yeah, uh, just to briefly explain, so when you do, in Pro Tools, when you do an LCR mix, it makes it like an actual left, center, right bus, which I'm only on two buses, my two mix. So uh, in HD, you have a down mixer, so you can fold those three uh, channels uh, multi-channel multi -channel channels down to a stereo. So that's why there's the mixer. That's great. All right. Well, you know what? That's all we have time for because Leggy is coming on like now. Who is? Leggy. Oh, cool. Good friend of ours. Oh, cool. He's going to show these lovely people about the arrow. Sweet. Yes. So thank you so much, Daryl Thorpe. You're welcome. And thank here's you. the amazing thing. Daryl Thorpe is coming back tomorrow at 1 p.m. Same time, same channel. you know what channel. we should do? What? We should start from there. Okay. We should pick it up from where we left off. Oh. So you guys must come back tomorrow at 1 p.m. to get the rest of this story. It's a cliffhanger. Wait till you see the end. It's amazing. All right. a lot of tracks. We hope to see you tomorrow at 1 p.m. Thank you so very much. And thank you, Daryl, for bringing this session and showing us. Thank you, guys. And stay around because this is a good demo coming right up. <laughs> <laughs>